Hey, will you two let me in on what's going on here? And how the hell did you get here from the Raven so fast without a car? Skanky, um, I truly apologize for my behavior tonight and any pain that I might have caused you. You're not going to give me an answer, are you? Welcome back, friends. Welcome back. It's time for another episode of the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. This is a Forever Night episode. Season 1, episode 18, Feeding the Beast. <gasps> The Beast. The Beast. <laughs> Side note, if you haven't watched What We Do in the Shadows, the movie, you should probably go watch it. Because I guarantee you Matt's going to do The Beast a bunch. Every time. Every time. Uh, television show is great, too. So actually the whole property is just great. What We Do in the Shadows. Even Wellington Paranormal. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. I don't think it like it made it as long. No. Didn't get the publicity. Yeah, it was in a weird spot. Yeah, it was just in a weird spot. But it was really funny. So that's sad. All right, you ready to talk about Forever Night? I guess the uh, we can talk about the other vampire show. <laughs> the not what we do in the shadows vampire show, but the, the, uh, the other one. The yeah. one with the vampire detective. What we do in the shadows, uh, the movie, has vampires and has detectives. Yeah, but not the same together all in one package all right well hi i'm rachel and i'm matt welcome to the strange and beautiful book club So we open on somebody making out with a dude in what looks like a nursery. A vaguely familiar silhouette. I don't know. Maybe you know her. Maybe you don't know her. Have you ever heard of somebody named Carrie Ann Moss? She was in this movie. It was called, um, uh, oh, was it? The, the, the Matrix. Matrix? <laughs> She's Trinity from The Matrix. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I knew that. But we were, that was a joke. I knew that was for the, the listeners. That was for the listeners. I knew what the Matrix was. But this is Carrie Ann Moss. She's a little baby Carrie Ann Moss. She's okay. only like 25 in this. I've rediscovered the memory of oh, this episode. Welcome. Welcome. And Carrie Ann Moss is making out with a dude in this nursery. And we don't see her face, but that's her profile. We all know who this is. And the guy doesn't. She's at, uh, She's obviously asking for more, and the fellow that she's making out with is not willing to give her what she's asking for. Right. He says something like, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. So she leaves. He's like, this is sick. I can't. This is too much for me. And so he leaves, and we find out we are at an AA meeting. We aren't just at an AA meeting. We're at like an AA dedicated campus of some kind, because they have these big, the 12 steps are posted mm -hmm. on the stage. Seems like this place has something going on like every night. Yeah. Like I think every it, time they go there, there's, there's stuff there. happening. I think it's an AA like support group area, not like an AA that meets in the church basement every week or something. Right. This is Canada. So they may have some other. Well, we have a couple dedicated AA buildings around here. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> So we're at an AA meeting. <laughs> I've, I've never received any of that. Okay. So. And we very quickly realized that Carrie Ann Moss, who is Monica, um, is this guy's sponsor. Right. And she was trying to... And she was trying to uh, make it with him. Oops. And then after the meeting, Skip, who this guy's name is Skip, which I guess they just named him Skip because he's in it for like two seconds. <laughs> They're like, we just skip this one. He gets in his car, and there's a bottle of liquor on the passenger seat. And he picks it up, and he's like, what is this, a fucking joke? And then somebody shoots him through the bottle of liquor, breaks the bottle Bang. of liquor. 
And kills Dead. him. Yeah. And then they light the alcohol on fire. Right. Just to add insult to Yeah, injury. just to really add, add it there, because there's no way this is going to burn enough to cover the bullet hole. Right. So clearly, this is some kind of statement. Revenge, Revenge, one might say. Yeah, and then we cut to the credits. So that's our setup. We're at an AA meeting. We've got Carrie Ann Moss. Dude got killed with his drug of choice. And bottom, bottom, we go to our credits. And when we come back, Skanky is attempting to interrogate everybody. Nick's not there. This is just Skanky. So there's nobody to buffer Skanky. And Skanky is in the worst place for Skanky, which is somewhere where he needs to be um, tactful and (laughs) sensitive and... Discreet. Discreet. And capable of understanding when to rein his mouth in and when not to rein his mouth in because he's trying to interrogate all of these people but of course they are at alcoholics anonymous they are not giving their last names they are giving their first name in a letter because they are under no obligation to give their full names to the police right. and they're not going to I mean, they're cooperating to the extent that they can, but... Right, but they're not going to give out any personal information because they don't want... Yeah, that would defeat they the purpose of the program. They don't want to get doxxed. Yeah, and it would defeat the purpose of the program. Right. And, you know, a lot of people are there because they're trying to, they're trying to seek help, but if anybody found out that they had a problem in the first place, it could cause more problems in right. their lives. He's, the way he's going about it... Uh, removes the second a yeah he's trying for not anonymous just substance abuse disorder yeah yeah so this is really not our moment for skanky to shine and he doesn't as one as usual expect. and he's after he gets done making fun of a couple of them for not having last names he attempts to bum a smoke from one of the addicts which sets up our mini tiny plot line in this episode which is skanky's own addiction to smoking that but, he is not acknowledging right because we've referenced it several times about him wanting to quit or myra wanting him to quit and he says he's quit or he's down to just a couple smokes a day but the, as the lady says yeah but how many do you bum from other people right and he's really not here to hear that he's not and receiving so he's, that right now he's bumming cigarettes like this entire episode. Right. Because it's it's trying to set up his, not everyone, no one is blameless. Right. No one is without addiction. Right. And his, uh, not necessarily hypocrisy, but his blindness to his own behavior. Yeah. His unwillingness to see himself. Right. Right. And, but he does eventually talk to Monica, who is Carrie Ann Moss, and she's happy to tell him her whole name. But... He does ask her, what's your addiction? And she goes, actually, that's too personal. Monica, if you don't mind me asking, what was your... Addiction? Yeah. I do mind. So she won't tell him what her addiction is because that's a step too far. Right. This is her public persona. Yeah. Is she... She's a... um, A sponsor. Right. And... Like, this is her job. She helps people recover. Right. And so if somebody tried to, you know, if somebody got her full name and looked into what she does, well, it's not going to disclose anything to her employer about her private activity or whatever. Right. So, yeah, yeah, she's fine being the spokesperson. Right. She's okay revealing her identity in order to save the others. In order to keep the others from having to disclose disclose more than they're willing to disclose. Yeah. And but she won't tell him what her addiction is, which is fair. It's bold of him to even have asked. Right. Um did we expect more from Skanky? Not necessarily at this point in the season. So it it happens. And then we cut to Nick and we find out why Nick is not with them, which is he's on vacation. And he's using this vacation. To paint a painting very aggressively (laughs) and frantically. Yep. He is 
scrubbing this paintbrush, uh, dripping paint all over the floor, just really into this painting and the phone rings. And he reaches for something and it turns out he's reaching for a bottle, not the phone. <laughs> Has he ever answered the phone <laughs> when Skanky calls? Because our plot device in this is always that the... Maybe a handful of times. That the answering machine picks up and then we get Skanky right. monologue. Right, that's how he uses, that's what he uses to screen his phone calls. Yeah, so it's Skanky. And Skanky's like, Nick, you got any bad habits? Oh, right, because I guess the next scene is at the police station. Yeah. And Stone Tree encouraged Nick to come in on his day off. Right. Nick's like, um, I'm on vacation. Did anybody, did, did anybody fucking write that down? Right next. Yeah, we wrote it down right next to Nick is allergic to the sun and can't go out during the day. And then we gave it just as much credit as we do that <laughs> one. <laughs> right. But we find out, A, Nick's on vacation, and B, since he wasn't there at the AA meeting when the cop showed up. Nobody knows he's a cop. Nobody knows he's a cop, which makes him the perfect cop to go undercover at the AA meeting. And Nick is immediately wary about this because he should be. This is super tasteless. (laughs) Right? (laughs) To trick all of these people... Who are there legitimately to seek help. Right. And compromising this whole structure. Yeah, compromising their recovery. For people to safely disclose very personal details. Yes. This is a lot. Uh, But Nick agrees. At least he's not wearing a wire. Yeah, that's true. Um, Nick agrees. I think because he's kind of like, hmm, I've never tried AA. I could give this a shot. Yeah, this 12-step thing. I've heard good things about it. Yeah, technically, he's addicted. He's addicted in the same way that I'm addicted to eating, because I need to do it in order to stay alive. Right. (laughs) And he needs to drink blood in order to stay alive. But hey, let's call it an addiction. That's fine. That's what Natalie keeps telling him. Right. Is that he's an addict, except during Dark Knight Part 2, when he finally made it three days without blood, she gives him blood to save his life. She was like, what, you want to starve to death? Right, because in that situation, he was so weak, he could barely move. Right. But in this episode... But we're still clinging to the idea that this is an addiction. If we just stop doing it, he'll be fine instead of, oh, I don't know, starving to death. <laughs> right. Is Was it withdrawal or was it starving? Pick one, Natalie. Which one is it? Yeah. So Nick is, uh, he's like, okay, that's fine. Yeah, we'll try it. So he joins AA. And of course, guess who's his sponsor? I get the sense that Monica is like everybody's sponsor. Right. Or is it just the good looking guys? Well, no wonder Monica is unwell. She's got a lot on her plate. (laughs) Literally everyone that shows up, they're like, oh, you should go with Monica. She's the best. She's the best sponsor ever. That is a lot of stress to put on somebody. Yeah. So she meet, he meets Monica and Hillary immediately. Which and Hillary is Monica's sister. sister. And Hillary is trying to get Nick to go elsewhere. You know, there's other AA groups because she immediately sees that Monica's like, oh, ho, ho, ho. hello. Right. She's like, you may want to like shop around. Yeah. This group may not be the right group for you. This group is not the right group for you. You could shop around. You could go. This is exactly how my mother communicates. What she's trying to say is, you aren't welcome here, Nick. We need you to go somewhere else. Because my sister is incorrigible, and she's already got her eyes set on you, and I can see it. But what she's saying is, hey, do you really think here is best for you? Maybe. Do you th- don't you want to, do you want to try you know, just checking out some other groups? You should. You should totally go check out other groups. Right. Immediately. Yeah. Do you want to 
is her way of saying you should. Maybe it's because she spotted but. Nick just whole ass grabbing the sign in sheet and shoving it in his pocket. Nah, he's way too stealthy for that. The whole ass sign in sheet. I mean, granted, he can't take a picture with his cell phone or anything. So I get it. There's not another way for him to record this. But surely. <laughs> This feels so much like an invasion of privacy. It is. It is an invasion of privacy. It's a lot to take in. He walks into this mixer. It's like an AA mixer, I guess. And he literally walks over to the guest sheet and just rips the page off, sticks it in his pocket, and then goes to circulate and say hi to everybody. And after he meets Monica and Hillary, he meets Harry, who's one of Monica's sponsors, or her... Sponsy. Sponsees, <laughs> one of the people the she is. is sponsoring, and he is awfully friendly. He's like rubbing Monica's shoulders. He's acting a little handsy, which we would be more mad about if he didn't immediately die. <laughs> right. He pretty much immediately after this scene gets killed, and we don't. We see him get injected with a drug, which we assume is his drug of choice. And then when we zoom out from the blood, there's a chalk outline. So he's been discovered. The police have been called. And Natalie drops the bombshell that this guy had recently had sex. Extremely recently. And so had the previous victim. Right. Which, didn't she reject him in the nursery? No, he rejected, Skip rejected Monica. Right, but she said that he had just recently had sex when he was killed in the car. Which I don't know how she could tell when he was burned alive. Or when he was burned. I don't know. I'm not sure how you check that. Not for a guy. Residue, I guess. Residual. Okay, sponsy is a word. There you go. You didn't hear my residual fluids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, however they know, Natalie knows. Natalie fucking knows. This guy had recently had sex. Maybe they'd had sex like a day before. I don't know how recent recent is. You know what? It's fine. We'll just accept it. These guys had recently had sex. Full stop. Moving on. Nick is acting a little off in this interaction because he just went to his first AA meeting and he learned that the first step was admitting to someone that he trusted and whose opinion he valued that he is powerless before his addiction. Right. So he chooses skanky. Mistake number one. Which means (laughs) right whole ass in front of Natalie, Nick calls out Skanky as the person whose opinion he values the most. Which Natalie feels great about. Natalie is fucking standing right there. He could have very much, he could have very much gone ahead and just confessed to Natalie. Natalie would have understood immediately and been supportive, but Skanky is like, I'm sorry, what? You have a problem? Problem with what? Right. Skanky just kind of laughs at him. He's like, look, I I don't want to hear about it, man. I don't want to know. I just don't want to know. I want to live in ignorance. Because if I don't know, it doesn't exist. So please don't tell me anything more about it. And Nick's like, well, I did it. That's probably fine. Close enough. Close enough. And he goes home to pour out all of his Kirkland blood bottles. He just, it's a lot. He spent a lot of time bottling that. He had to get his fancy shirt on. Mm-hmm. He had to get out his Kirkland blood keg <laughs> his, <laughs> and his, his gravy cask. boat. <laughs> his gravy boat. <laughs> Bottle all this shit. Yeah, that was so weird. <laughs> now he's had to dump it all out. And yeah, he has quite a few bottles of blood. You must go through them quickly because they don't go bad. Because he doesn't make any real effort to like, can them, you know, to make it so that they would stay fresh 
for longer. Right. He just puts a cork in it, which we've right. seen my, because now we know exactly how my, he bottles them. My head cannon is that you get the cask of blood and you add some vampire blood to it and that stops it from going bad. Oh, okay. That's an interesting head cannon. And then you can put it in bottles or whatever and keep it cool and it keeps it fresh fresh for a while. Wow. Okay. That's a good, that's okay. Sure. There's, there's some kind of process that they have for preserving the blood because the blood doesn't coagulate. Yeah, so clearly they've got it down however they've got it down. Because he he has a lot of very liquid, very uncoagulated right. blood to dump out of these green bottles. And then we get a, mm, for lack of a better phrase, vampire wet dream. <laughs> because yeah. he is jonesing. He's off the sauce. He's off the blood. He needs his fix. He needs it. He's... He really wants a fix, but he doesn't have one. So as he's sleeping, his mind makes up this story of LaCroix and Monica. And LaCroix is like carrying Monica, and then she's laying on the podium, and blood is pouring off the podium. And Nick's, and Nick ends up biting Monica at LaCroix's insistence. And then he wakes up. Because he's so freaked out by this vivid um, wet dream that he just had. And he calls Monica because she's his sponsor. And he needs to have someone help him through this. And she takes him out to a cafe. Like a diner. Like a diner. Which is not the same diner as the nightmare that he had in Dying for Fame. Definitely not. Definitely not. But this time, he really, really does eat a French fry. And he's super dramatic about it. He, like, shoves it in his mouth, and he's like... And he's surprised yeah, that he doesn't vomit it out. Yeah, and he says that he just jumped off a cliff, and it didn't hurt at all. She's like, it's, um, it's just a fry. He's like, it's not about the fry, Monica. It's not about the fry. Is it always this bad? Sometimes it's worse. Our worst victims are ourselves, you know. Not with me. And he uses this as an opportunity to get some support, get a little sponsor time, and to interrogate her about the murder. Um, build rapport. Um, I don't think he builds rapport because he's just straight up like, so, um, you had a relationship with both Skip and Harry, huh? It's weird. And she's like, um, I don't think you get to ask me those questions because I'm not allowed. It's against the rules for fraternization between sponsor and sponsee. So I, I resent the implication. And we're all such great rule followers here. Yeah. She's like, I would never break that kind of a rule. I absolutely keep it professional and separate at all times. She for the next it. 15 minutes. For the next 15 minutes. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't, obviously, because we opened on her making out with a dude, which, to be fair, it was a silhouette. We didn't see right. that it was her. And we knew it was her because we all know who Carrie Ann Moss is. Right. In 1993, she wouldn't have been as recognizable. This is, this is a whole six years before she's in The Matrix. Or she becomes Carrie Ann Moss of the Matrix. And we get more Skinky. Skinky being in denial about his smoking and his quote, right. addiction. Right. Doesn't he ask? He tries to get a cigarette off somebody and they don't have one. And so he gets real frantic. Well, he asks and they're like, he, he just keeps having to come up against his own addiction. And he's also kind of reeling from the fact that Nick professed right. the fact that he has an addiction and that he is powerless Right, it. and so now Nick, the unstoppable super partner, yeah, has vocally articulated that he has a a flaw, a weakness. Yeah, he has a problem, and Skanky's like, "Oh shit, I needed him to be perfect because he's who I live vicariously through." <laughs> <laughs> 
And Nick is actually doing really well. He shows up at the precinct and Natalie's like, wow, you've got actual color in your cheeks. Like you look really good. And Nick's like, wow, thanks. I feel really good. And Natalie's like, don't get too fucking comfortable, Nick. It's not going to (laughs) work. Pick a side, Natalie. I mean, well, uh, this may be a little bit of um, leftover salt from earlier. Yeah. When he confessed to Skanky instead of her. Well, it wouldn't really work with her because she already knows. Right, but has he ever actually articulated the fact that he can't stop drinking blood because it is too hard for him to quit? um, We don't know. He may feel like... She should know this. He shouldn't have to say it to her. (laughs) Yeah, I'm still stuck on the skank. I mean, I get why we did skanky. It's a character building. It's a relationship building. It's a a way of advancing drama. It generates more drama. If he had just confessed to Natalie, she we don't get the the layer of confusion and of skanky having this realization that Nick is not exactly who he thought he was. But at the same time, Natalie is clearly salty about this because she is not optimistic when Nick says he's doing really good. Of course, she's been through this with Nick several times now. Right. And he has continuously gone back to what he was doing before. So I can kind of understand why she is not all on the bandwagon, even though Nick appears to be doing really well. And she's like, look, you you need to be careful. You are getting your hopes up. And if you get your hopes up too high and then your heart gets broken, I'm really afraid of what might happen. So I right, need you to. She, she knows from the stories that Nick has told her that it once he gets hungry enough, like it'll take over. Yeah. And and especially if he has a an emotionally vulnerable moment right then you know the hunger will just push him aside yeah. and just get the blood that it wants and natalie is also i think as i've stated in previous episodes low key terrified of nick because she's well aware of what he is capable of doing and she probably doesn't want to be around if he has a relapse And goes on a binge because this isn't like I go to the store, the party store and buy myself some, a couple bottles of liquor and get shit faced. This is, I could literally go out and kill people to get what I want. So a relapse on Nick looks a whole lot scarier than a relapse from most addicts. Scarier in a, he wouldn't be personally harmed. In a harmed. collateral damage. In a collateral yeah. damage, yeah. not He wouldn't be personally harmed by it. In fact, he'd probably be better if he went out and went on like a <sighs> blood-fueled murderous rampage. But nobody else would be happy. So she's like, look, please, for everyone's sake, keep your expectations realistic. And he's like, well, you're just being a fucking spoil sport, and I don't need to receive that right now. I don't. So they go to talk to Stone Tree, and they find out that all the victims are connected to Monica Howard. (gasps) Surprise. Surprise to no one. And then we get another driving clip, which they must have put a lot of work into the driving clips for Dark Knight because we have used them. A bunch. A bunch. And this is episode, what, 16, 17? And we're still using them. And we're still using them. This is a Dark Knight driving clip because he's wearing the popped collar and the white sweater hey, from Dark Knight. It's free real estate. It is. <laughs> if it was good enough for Dark Knight, it's good enough for this episode. That's what my mother always says. And Monica follows him home. <gasps> and for some reason... After she follows him home, he's like, hey, fancy meeting you in my driveway. Do you want to come up for coffee? (laughs) (laughs) Weird. Did you have business 
in my apartment because I live. Oh yeah, I, I live in like in the neighborhood. A warehouse. There's literally one, no reason why anyone else would be around <laughs> here. But hey, it's fine. It's fine. And so he brings her in for coffee, ostensibly, and she's admiring his painting. And he tells her that it's his beast. The beast. The beast. And she's like, oh, yeah, this is kind of hot. And she starts putting the moves on him. And Nick is like, no, 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 you're, you're my sponsor. You're here to help me. You're, you're, you're supposed to be my rock. You're supposed to be my reason why I follow all the rules. And she's like, nah, they're just guidelines. What's Nobody the- really recovers. You can't actually get over your I know. addiction. She's like the only way, the only thing that makes getting over your addiction bearable is if you give in every once in a while. I'm trying to recover, Monica. Come on, Nick. Recovery is just the spaces between fixes. It's not like doing something about the need once in a while is going to make it any stronger. And he's like, no, no. You don't want me to give into my addiction right now because you are throwing yourself at me and it's exactly what I want. I had a wet dream about this last night. Do you want me to tell you about it? I, I killed you, but my master was there. It was a whole thing. And she is really throwing herself at him, but he keep to his credit, he keeps pushing her away. And even Well, when- he's done this to every woman who's thrown themselves at him for at least this whole season, yeah, probably longer than that. And she tells him recovery is just the space between fixes. And Which is the first step toward her, yeah. towards him uh, realizing her manipulation and betrayal of him. Yeah, and he does eventually just push her away completely. And as she's leaving, she tells him, you better learn how to carry your beast because even if you get through all tw- all 12 steps, it's never going away. Why do you all have to be the same, huh? Coming after me, bleeding with your addictions. God forbid I should weaken for a fraction of an instant. Does that make me a monster? It never goes away, Nick. Our beasts are on our backs forever. There's no magic bullet. There's no cure. And you better learn how to carry your beast on your back. Right. It's, it's always, always going to be, be there. there. And, Jinx. And there's nothing you can do, nothing, to make it go away. The best you're ever going to be able to do is not, gonna, is not give in to it. And she's like, so peace out, motherfucker. I'm going to go fuck somebody else, and I'm going to enjoy doing it. Hashtag Monica. And she leaves. She goes down his... Elevator quote, question mark. Unquote, elevator. <laughs> quote, unquote, elevator. And oh, which I was looking on that page where I found. So I found some plans of Nick's loft that some long ago fan had created. And I put them on the Instagram and I credited the creator. And I was reading through some other pages that were linked to it that broke down the parts of Nick's loft. And they talked about the elevator. But they didn't talk about whether or not it was a real elevator. They were just like, oh, it has no, f- this is the door on the front. It has a safety cage. They And they put up pictures of where people have used the elevator. But they didn't clear up the fact that this is obviously not an elevator. So the elevator mystery it remains unsolved. And so now Nick is questioning everything. Because he was... On his way to recovery, he was in the golden the golden era where he'd gotten off of his drug, which was his his blood, obviously, and he was feeling great. He was feeling good, and then he Monica even ate food. Even ate food, and then Monica betrayed him. And Nick is nothing if not emotionally fragile, and so she stomped all over his little baby hope, and now he's going to get even. By just being who he is. Stone Tree wants to brought in for questioning. And guess who drew the gig? You did, you lucky bastard. And uh, by the way, what I said earlier about the addiction stuff, stricken from the record, pal. I apologize. You're my partner and I'll take you any way I can get you. Bye. Good. And so hallucinatory LaCroix shows up. Because LaCroix is present 
in all of Nick's lowest moments, even if LaCroix is dead. lives in his mind rent-free. Yes, yes. It's like, the, I mean, basically, if you had an abusive parent that hung around for 800 years, you would have PTSD flashbacks of them, just like Nick does. And so LaCroix shows up, and LaCroix's like, come on, Nick. Where'd you hide it? Where, where's that one more bottle? Where's that one bottle that you saved just in case? And Nick's like, fuck right I did. So he goes over <laughs> to the to the uh, fireplace. And he reaches around the edge of the fireplace and pulls out a half full bottle. Because he had one stashed there. Which it's not been in the refrigerator. So just throwing that out there. But Might he be drinks a little it. sour. <laughs> fermented (laughs) so he has a relapse of epic cringeworthy proportions because he not only drinks this bottle he then goes to the raven and even Jeanette is like oh yeah and he's chugging Jeanette's bottles which Jeanette's uh, beverage yeah actually has human blood yes Yes, yeah. and wine. Well, yeah. yeah. Right, but human blood. So he was like, <laughs> we're going all the way back. And right. so he goes... He's not... He hasn't bitten anybody yet. 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 And Jeanette is like, oh no. Because I have to imagine Jeanette has seen this before. Jeanette's been here. She's been oh, yeah. through Nick's toxic spiral of deprivation and indulgence and deprivation and indulgence and she recognizes this period for what it is which is a moment where nick is really unstable and unpredictable because he went off blood for a couple of days and now it's like he has given himself permission to just do whatever he wants because monica showed him that no one that This is a consistent theme in this show, which is humanity is never as good as Nick thinks it is. Right. He equates mortality and morality. That if you are mortal, you are inherently more moral than he is. And so every time someone, some mortal, shows him that they are not as moral as he wants them to be, he can't handle it. He needs humanity to be on this pedestal. Because he needs it to be a goal he can achieve. A goal that's worth achieving. A goal that's worth achieving. And any time that he realizes that this person that he had put on the pedestal doesn't deserve that spot, Nick can't handle it. And so he had put Monica up there as this is a person who had overcome their addiction. This is a person who had helped others overcome their addiction. This is someone that I can strive to be like. This is a touchstone for me to reach. And then as soon as he realized she wasn't worthy of the podium he put her on, not because she's a bad person, but because she tried to get him to indulge in his own addiction, he can't, he, he loses it. He goes to the Raven. He's, Binging Binging. on blood. And Jeanette is so concerned. She actually calls Skanky and Natalie to come get Nick. Because she realizes she is not the one who's going to save Nick in this situation. Right. Because she isn't ever the human goal that he's working towards. He needs his human friends to remind him of who he wants to be. Right. Of who he's trying to be. And so she calls Skanky and Natalie before to come get him before he does something that he really is going to regret. Right. And I think Jeanette needs Nick to be the one who is always striving to be uh, like whatever she perceives his ideal to be. Yeah. Right. He's always striving toward this ideal. And I think she needs that just as a reference point in her life, just so she doesn't go too far. Yeah. Like away from humanity. Yeah. Even if she doesn't even think it that way. 
But, uh, I think neither one of them want to become LaCroix. Right. And Nick being on one end and LaCroix being on the other end of the extremes and Jeanette in the middle. Right. If easier. Jeanette has virtuous Nick yeah. as a reference point for how to live in the world, she, all, she knows that she will never go all the way over to the LaCroix end of the spectrum. Right. He keeps her in the middle. Yeah. Which is where, right where she likes to be. Right where she likes to be. And so Nick, at, by the time Skanky and Natalie arrive, he has seduced a woman off the dance floor. A human woman. A human woman. And taken her to the back. And in his defense, I think he thought she was a vampire because she's wearing really pale makeup. Because she's, right. she's done up in goth chic. And he's like, I think you belong back here with the denizens of the night. And then they have this really weird, awkward exchange where he's, she's like, is death sexy? And he's like, death is super sexy. He's just <laughs> like, he's trying to flirt and she's trying to flirt, but she doesn't really know what's going on. And he just wants to kill her. He's just trying to. He's, uh, he's thirsty. Yeah. He's a little thirsty and he's, I think unconsciously trying to talk himself out of it or give her a chance to talk him out of it. Right. I and, think, yeah, I think he's trying to give her enough signals yeah. of what he wants to do that she can reject him. Yeah. But she's not because he's an 800-year-old vampire and maybe he, like, he's kind of charming her, like whatever, hypnotizing her. I don't think she, we don't get our heartbeat. That's true. But I think what it's just that she's young and this guy is clearly digging her aesthetic. Right. And she she probably recognizes that, oh, this is the guy that Jeanette's like totally in love with. Yeah. But Jeanette would never admit that to anyone. Yeah, I mean it's like, he's oh, a this is this is the guy who's, you know, with the owner of the club, this club that I love the aesthetic of. Yeah. Yeah. And Jeanette is outside the room. And when Skanky and Natalie arrive, Skanky and Natalie, Skanky, Natalie ends up going in after Nick. And stopping Skanky and from tell going Skanky, in. And Skanky, don't, you know what, you stay right here. And so Skanky is really trying to be supportive and understanding right. this moment. Because he doesn't this know. This is probably the most compassion we've ever seen out of Skanky. Right. Which, because Skanky is not an uncompassionate character. Right. He is a tactless character. He's, he's kind of a macho character. And so this is like the most we've ever seen him drop the macho mask. Yeah. Where and he's like, okay, like this Nick, is actually serious. Yeah. So I need to be sincere yeah, like, for the first time Nick, ever. Buddy. I, I, I'm here for you. I am so sorry that I wasn't listening to you before. When you told me that you were having a problem. And I'm, I really apologize. Like, I'm here for you. I don't know what the fuck is going on. I don't know what you're addicted to. I have no idea. I'm literally, he's the most clueless person in this room. Right. Jeanette knows what's happening. Natalie knows what's happening. And by the time Natalie gets in there, the goth chick knows what's happening. But Skanky is in the dark. Completely in the dark. But still trying to be a good friend to Nick. Even without having all the details and without even asking for the details. Right. He's like, whatever, man, don't, you don't need to tell me what's happening. Just know that I'm here for you. And Natalie is trying the tough love approach. She's like, you don't want to do this. Don't be ridiculous. You are being really fucking ridiculous right now. And this is why I told you not to get your hopes up. And Nick ends up vamping out in front of the girl and she's, he's going to bite her. And he gets interrupted enough that she gets away. But nobody erases her memory. So she is number 14. No, 15. Last person was 14. No, this person, last person was 13. We were 12, and then we hit 13 with um, the guy that got thrown on the manure pile. And now we're at number 14. Uh, I have uh, notes. Well, Actual notes. You know what? You go back uh, and listen to the episodes. And if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. Blah. <laughs> See? It was an empty That's threat. That's work. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but before this girl leaves, we get another Nick arm grab, which I feel like this should be patented. The forearm arm grab that Nick does. Trademarked. Yeah. And he's like, I hear you. You're right, Natalie. This isn't the woman I want to kill. This isn't the person who betrayed me. This isn't who I'm really thirsty for. I'm going to go find her. You're completely correct. And so he just whooshes out to go find Monica. Because she's the one who betrayed him. She's the one who brought all this on him. It's not his fault. Obviously, it's got to be Monica's fault. And so he's like, I'm going to show her what backsliding really is. And so he goes and finds her like immediately. I don't know how he finds her immediately, but he does. She's at a brothel. And a uh, kind of a brothel. Because he goes in, the guy's like, hey, man. Oh, yeah. The mas- it's like a massage thing. Well, he's like, I got a couple of girls free or whatever. And so Nick's like, nope, I'm here for Monica. And he's, she's with a client. But he says she'll be free in a minute. And so Nick just goes upstairs. And Monica is somewhat in flagrante with somebody. And he kind of realizes... In, a mo- in this moment, he gets a little clarity that she is as helpless to her addiction, helpless before her addiction, as he is before his. So all it took was one moment of weakness on her part, and he completely backslid. And that is a lot of pressure to put on one single woman, that she has to be absolutely perfect, or she will bring about the downfall of everyone in AA because they are all her sponsors. <laughs> all her sponsees because everyone they talk to Monica's their sponsor. And so he realizes the pressure that she's under and that she is as addicted to her drug of choice as he is. And so he doesn't kill her and they end up getting, they end up capturing her because at this point they've realized that Monica is connected to all the murders. So they think she has something directly to do with it. But The killer is right-handed and Monica is left-handed because they get her to make a list of all the people that she was quote unquote with at the AA group. So she's like, well, it's going to be a long list. And they're like, well, go ahead and write them all out. And so she picks up the pen with her left hand and starts writing, which reminds me of there's an episode of Lucifer where they have to interview all of his past sexual partners Mm -hmm. and there's like a line out the station. (laughs) Yep. I love Lucifer. And so Nick goes to AA now because they know Monica's not the killer. But something connected to Monica is happening. And they need more information. And they need information from the people at AA. And the only way to really get it is for him to tell everybody, hey, look, I freely admit I'm an addict, but I'm also a cop. And I've been here kind of, sort of spying on everybody. And I kind of need help, your help specifically. And I will do everything I can to keep you anonymous. But if you want to save the lives of more people in this group, somebody, if anybody knows anything, they need to come forward. And almost immediately, Hillary calls and asks to meet him at the AA center. And when he gets there, one of the helpful people at AA is already there, but they're dead. Bum bum. And it's Angie. Doesn't really matter, but her name is Angie. R.I.P. Angie. She was really nice to Nick when he first arrived. And she was just in generally a nice, she was a character we interact with a couple of times. And she was also one of Monica's people. Were they sleeping together? Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. It's kind of implied they are. But in like a 1993, we can't have a same-sex couple on television way. Kind of in the way we sort of obscured the fact that the enforcers are definitely a couple. Yes. (laughs) Matt just raised an eyebrow. (laughs) Identical. Right. Situation. And Angie is dead. And Monica shows up. And Nick is like, Monica, what are you doing here? And Monica's like, well, Angie told me I needed to come. And then somebody shows up. And they have a gun. And they end up kidnapping Monica. And, hey guys, it's Hillary. Because Hillary could have just fled and gotten away. But she had to be theatrical. So she went up and was confessing at the podium to no one. And just confessing 
all of her crimes about how Monica... Well, while Monica was in the chair behind her. Yeah, how Monica had a difficult childhood and she just longed for connection and all she was really looking for was love and she was just addicted to love and that shouldn't be something that she's punished for. Right, and she... Hillary interpreted all of Monica's... Um, dalliances. Dalliances with the other person taking advantage of Monica's addiction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a bittersweet, but we get everything wrapped up. Neat little bow. It's really convenient. Nick ends up talking her down. He gets the gun. Nobody gets, I mean, aside from the people who've already been killed, nobody else gets hurt. And Hillary gets arrested, and we assume Monica gets off because Monica. <laughs> <laughs> but <I'm>... Phrasing. <laughs> we assume Monica is exonerated because... She didn't have anything to do with it. It was her sister who was killing people who she felt were taking advantage of Monica. And at the very end, even Skanky turns down a cigarette. Siggy, Skanky? You gotta be kidding. So everyone confronted their addictions. Skanky confronted the fact that he's not perfect and Nick's not perfect, and that's okay. And it's okay to see yourself for who you are. And Nick went right back to what he normally does. So clearly we've dispensed with his idea. He didn't go find another AA meeting, even though it was working for him. He was just like, well, that didn't work. So (laughs) darn, shoot. (laughs) Well, good shot, everybody. We gave it a whole, uh, I don't know, 48 hours. (laughs) Yeah. Out of 800 years. (laughs) And we end our wrap up. Our wrap up is, (laughs) Matt was groaning in the chair. But I love this wrap up because... Nick has finished his painting, his painting of the beast, his beast. Oh, yes. Yeah, Skanky comes in. And, yeah. And Natalie says uh, she likes it. I really like it. And Skanky's like, oh, yeah, it's nice. And Nick is like, I do not trust your judgment. You have a velvet Elvis painting in your locker. And so Skanky goes on this long tirade about why he likes Nick's painting. And it is extremely eloquent extremely well-versed, extremely cognizant of the type of language that art critics use to talk about art. Right. Uh, Nothing, just something I've been fooling around with. Well, you think I know nothing about art? No, it's just that you have a velvet painting of Elvis in your locker. Very funny. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a kind of subtextual renaissance of the ideal. The playful use of light and shadow, if I'm not mistaken, portends almost a, a stylistic opening, no? Unfolding within the realms of psychological The nature of self-acceptance, the, the journey from darkness into light, from doubt into... Hope? Exactly. The, the destruction of the existential, and I'm delighted to see the triumph of the humanistic. Myra keeps a copy of the Andy Warhol diaries in the John. And both Nick and Natalie are like... Stunned. Uh, skanky? Skanky's like, yeah, Myra has a copy of the Warhol Diaries in the bathroom. (laughs) (laughs) So he's just like he's paraphrasing from the Warhol Diaries. But he did a good job of summarizing, of taking stuff that he'd learned in the Warhol Diaries and then applying it to Nick's painting. So there you go. There's Skanky's hidden depths. He was able to bullshit convincingly. Yeah. 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 This was an interesting. Kind of a development episode for Nick. I mean, we already know that Nick is uh, volatile because he can't just break locks. He's got to fucking rip whole doors off, toss right. them down alleyways and shit. So we know he's a little over the top. Nick is a little bit extra. And he definitely gets really excited before he ever leaps. And we got a good view of that in this episode of his needle swing from one extreme to the other. And we got an idea that some of the people in his life who he's been around 
for more than a little while are all very accustomed to his needle swings, his one extreme to the other, especially Jeanette, who is immediately leery of the type of attitude that Nick is in when he's at the Raven. You would think Jeanette would celebrate. Right, that they could have yeah, a, a wild binge night together. Right, like, yeah, absolutely, bring another bottle. Right. That's why I think Jeanette knows that she needs Nick and I to think, be, like, the better person. And I think she knows the importance of Nick's morality right. to Nick. To, yeah, to Nick. And so she is respecting his needs. Okay, how about this? I'm ready. <clears throat> and uh, here's how I've heard someone say it before. Jeanette wants what is best for the part of Nick that wants what is best for Nick. Yes. Which Even I, if that is not what like superficial Nick wants. Which I think is a testament to the connection that Nick and Jeanette have. Because you would expect Jeanette to exploit this for her own gain. Because she wants Nick back. Oh, yeah. And this would be a way for her to get Nick back as Nick the vampire. And not Nick the troubled wannabe mortal, which he has been for so long. And she does not jump at this opportunity. In fact, she calls the people that she knows are his support system and has them come in. Because she recognizes that this isn't her moment. That this isn't the time when she can support him. She needs somebody else. And she even calls in Skanky, who has no idea what Nick is, which is risking exposing what Nick is to Skanky because of the volatile mood that he's in. And she's still willing to do it because she probably knows what the fallout looks like. Because right. she's probably she's been probably with seen him this through this a bunch before. of times. Yes. Yep. And if she can do anything to prevent that, or at least maintain the moral high ground so that later he's like, why didn't you help me? She can say, I called your friends. I tried to dissuade you from doing this. I cut you off from getting more blood. And you were so determined, I couldn't stop you. But I tried. And so I think that's where they they are all coming to in this is we've seen this behavior from Nick before. How do we deal with it? Even Natalie seems somewhat versed because she's immediately cautious of his optimism. Right. Because she's probably seen the fallout from his... Probably on smaller scale events. Yeah. Than what Jeanette is uh, anticipating. Right. So I think this is a good... Is this my favorite episode? Hmm. Not necessarily. I don't watch it. I don't rewatch it as much as I rewatch some of them. But I think it's a good building episode for a lot of the characters. And we are sneaking up on the end of season one. So this is our our shot to really flesh out these characters before renewal season came around. And to really hook the audience with new revelations about who they are and about what they're capable of. And I think they do a good job with that. Yeah. It's not as funny as Father Figure. <laughs> it's not a funny episode. No. It deals with a lot of heavy themes which is the fact that what Nick is and what Nick has to do is very close to an addiction. That's one of the things I liked about the British being human is the vampires in the British being human, BBC being human, don't actually need blood. It is actually just an addiction. Um, I think it does enhance them. It, It keeps them from remembering what they've done. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so once you stop drinking blood, you remember all of the things you, you remember did. the the emotional significance. Yeah. So the of what, longer the things that you've done. You go without giving up blood. The more terrible things you do, the harder it is to give up blood because the more you remember the terrible things you've done. Right. And I love that concept. And I liked that show a lot. It's a good show. So if you have British being human, highly recommend it. The American version is good, too. But in the American version, he has to drink blood, which is still good. They still really treat it like an addiction that he can't shake. And I like that view, and I like it when we explore that. And we do a lot of that in this episode. 
And even though it's a little hard to listen to Nick try to talk to this, like, 19-year-old goth chick. <laughs> Especially since he doesn't even take off his coat. I think that's part of what bothers me is he's wearing his, uh, like, his outside coat the mm-hmm. entire time. And she's in, like, a strappy black dress. Right. He's always wearing his coat. Maybe he doesn't know when it's cold and hot or whatever. Or the purple members only jacket it, just hits. It might so be... Right. Uh, it might be symbolic, like metaphorical. He's got a lot of layers. Like he, he always like an undead onion. He keeps his uh, boundaries up. Oh yeah, could be like his collar; they're always popped. Well, that's to prevent a vampire from biting him on the neck. <laughs> I don't think that's what that is. <laughs> Keep your hand at the level of your eyes. <laughs> So that way the vampire bites your arm instead of your neck. That's what we're missing. A Forever Night musical. Even Buffy got a musical. You know what? Dying for Fame was kind of the Forever Night musical. Yes. Yep. We even got Nick the... sang. Did he? Yeah. When he's sitting at like the vanity in his like dream mode. I don't think he mode. sings though, does he? I thought he sang. God, I don't know. Maybe I blocked it out. I know at the end he does the fist in the air from Breakfast Club. Yeah. He like spins and walks away. So anyway, I think we should leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Before this, so we have an Instagram. Uh, we have eighteen followers on Spotify now. Eighteen. Woo-hoo. I don't know if you know this, guys, but we're kind of a big deal. And you know, what? I'm going to try to say folks. I was reading about that the other day. A more ah. uh, gender neutral, generic term for a group of people. Folks. How about dudes. No, dudes still has a. Male connotation. We're going to go folks. Okay. All right, folks. All right, folks. Or friends. Either one. Anyway, we have Instagram. It's that Strange and Beautiful Book Club. We also have a Patreon. Strange and Beautiful Book Club. There's a link to both in the show notes. Uh, Feel free. Hop over to Patreon. Join the $1 tier. Buy us a cup of coffee every month. Come on. what's What's a dollar? Um, I'm really looking to get enough support on Patreon that we never have to do ads. I would love that. Or sign up with some, like anyone would ever invite us to be on it. (laughs) (laughs) Like Wondry or something. I don't want to be behind a paywall. I just don't. I don't, that's not, that's not why we started this. Uh, and help just build the community. That's what I really want. It's just a community of people that interact. And we talk about all these fun, forgotten television shows and movies. If you want to give us a recommendation, I don't talk about it as much as I used to, but we still have a recommendation form. It's on our website. You can go there, click on it, fill out the Google form. It'll send me an email. You can fill out whatever sections you want to. Um, and just tell us something you'd love to have us watch. Uh, we have gotten still three recommendations in the history of the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. So I'd love to add to that number. Feel free to hop over and suggest something. If you want to email us, you can at thehosts at strangeandbeautiful.club. If you want to email me personally, it's at rachel at strangeandbeautiful.club. And if you want to email Matt, that would be matt at strangeandbeautiful.club. Do you have anything you want to add? Nope, I think that's it. Super green. All right. So remember, sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful, too. So be who you are and love what you love. Until next time, friends. Bye. Bye.